And welcome to Car Con Carne, still here in quarantine, kept in isolation, quarantine con carne, uh, presented by our friends at Byron's Hot Dogs. You could win a $50 gift card to Byron's Hot Dogs, two locations in Chicago, Irving Park and Lawrence. Just sign up for the Car Con Carne newsletter from the link on the front page of carconcarne.com for your shot to win. My guest, she is a returning guest. Uh, she is fantastic. She is Sandy King Carpenter. She is a movie producer, a writer, a publisher, a director, entrepreneur, and Sandy, here we are at the end of 2020. Obey authority, stay asleep, conform, consume. It's funny how things always swing back to they live, isn't it? You know, uh, I, it never left there from the 80s. And I think that people literally let themselves be hypnotized. Um, starting from back, I always blame Aaron Spelling, um, into a certain mindset that under those Reagan years, people just got greedy and dumb and never stopped. So we can blame Reagan and Aaron Spelling for all things. Yeah, forward. you know, I used to I used to work on Aaron Spelling's uh, pilots and you just sit there and go, wow, this is like, you know, we're brainwashing people. People are, are naming their babies after villains. You know, what is wrong here? And, you know, I used to be a little creeped out by it. And, and he got, ah, don't worry about it. And I'm going to sit there and go, Are you sure about what we're doing? It somehow feels a little immoral. And he goes, ah, it's like a soap at night. Don't worry about it. And I said, people are naming their kids after Fallon. You know, this is not good. <laughs> you were an associate producer, but also a script supervisor on They yeah. Live. That means you're a detail person, right? I mean, you'd have to be a detail-oriented yeah. person to be a script supervisor. That's continuity? Yeah. It's continuity. It's a liaison between between the shooting crew, editorial staff, and production. So, you know, for me, it was a really uh, great position. I loved it because you got to see the whole picture. You got it literally, and you got to see how all the moving parts went together, and you got to um, keep the overview of what where you were headed day to day. And I bring that up because here we are. You're about eight years into Storm King um, as, a, as, a, as a publisher, though? Oh, uh, yeah, so, somewhere in there. You know, I'm really bad with dates. Like, I can't tell you when anything in my life happened, but yeah. As of this year, I can't keep track of anything. It, it, Janu <laughs> January seems like eight years ago. I, time true. is irrelevant at this point, so I get it. And I tend not to look back. I just always look at what's coming up. Well, the reason why I bring up the, the script supervisor and the detail thing, I feel like that's an important consideration as you are you know, it, several years into running a comic book company. You kind of have to have that, that business acumen and you, to be successful. Yeah. Um, yeah, you have to look ahead. You have to plan ahead. We have books that are you know three years out. Um, you have to solicit books eight months out. So... You know, there's a there's a track that goes on with being ready for stuff. So for people who may not be familiar, Storm King has been publishing awesome comics. I've got Asylum. I think that was uh, the OG uh, yeah. Storm King release behind me. Uh, great stuff. It, it, it's interesting. In the year 2020, arguably, yes, we're living in a dystopia. Things are horrific on the news as it is. But I, I find myself enjoying horror now more than ever in a weird, cathartic way. Like I've turned to horror as a kind of release is that does that ring true with you well yeah because it's you know horror has always been with us it always will be with us because it is a way to work through our fears it's a way to experience something vicariously and and conquer it uh, it's like getting on on a roller coaster and coming out and going yeah yeah it's that rush and, uh, Grave, oh, go ahead so I, I think it's the same thing and i i found that Unlike other tragedies that befell us, say like 9-11, like that one just gutted us because it, it was so fast and so profound that nobody wanted to hear sad stories or scary things because they felt so out of control. This is a little different in terms of national identity and in terms of what's happening to us and it feels so pervasive and you're locked up and you're isolated and you need somewhere to get that out. 
uh, we have no national coming together because you can't hug, you can't touch, you can't do right. anything else. So I think that's the kind of the difference. I have a, a dog who's very interested in, in the dinner I brought you tonight. <laughs> oh, so last time you did my podcast, back in the heady days of four years ago when we could go out and meet and hang out in a car together, we yeah. did the podcast in my car. And my lasting memory is, wow, what a delight Sandy King Carpenter is. What an interesting person. What a fascinating career. Your takeaway from that night is that I gave you a hard time about the way you ate hot dogs. <laughs> yes. Well, basically, you told me I couldn't qualify as a Chicago girl because I kind of thought Chicago style hot dogs were difficult for me. But I remember what you had on your hot dogs. And so since you're a guest in my house tonight, I brought you a Chicago style hot dog. I love it. So you have like relish and stuff on there? It's got mustard, relish, onions. It's brown mustard, which I, as I recall, mattered. It's delicious. Uh, not, not a traditional Chicago dog condiment, but brown mustard is delicious. And uh, we'll, we'll okay. accept it. Judges? Yeah, we'll, we'll take it. Okay. So that's your hot dog for tonight. I love uh, that. <laughs> I, I feel I feel like we've made great strides together, Sandy. <laughs> yes. Didn't we, say we, I was going to eat we, it, but it's we yours. really crossed a boundary here. <laughs> uh, so talking about Storm King Comics, yes. Graveyard Moon. It, first of all, this company has worked, does work with truly A-list comic creators. Uh, Steve Niles, uh, talk about an elevator pitch. The future of funeral services smashed with a space horror heist. That That's an elevator pitch right there. Sold. Done. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Well, that's that exactly how, how it kind of came uh, down when Steve and I were talking about it. And he goes, so there's this idea and, you know, and then they try and do this heist and they're robbing the, the coffins. And I went, cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what could go wrong? <laughs> and, and that says everything you need to know. The, the trade uh, that Kelly Jones cover, Kelly Jones, one of my all-time favorite Batman cover artists, just, you know, a Kelly Jones Image. Behind me, that's two pages out of uh, uh, Batman uh, Gotham at Midnight. Yeah, you know when you're looking at Kelly Jones' work. Yeah. So, question about Graveyard Moon. Cole, in the book, am I the only one who said he looks like Ernest Borgnine in Escape from New York? <laughs> I hadn't thought of that, but you know what? You're exactly right. <laughs> it, it all comes back around, doesn't it? You know... <laughs> We're, we're, we're limited in our imaginations. <laughs> no, you're definitely not. Well, you know, when I was a kid, many years ago, Sandy, um, you know, I grew up on John Carpenter movies. And as a kid, I probably shouldn't have seen John Carpenter movies. Mm -hmm. yeah, my dad took me to Halloween. I saw Escape from New York in the theater. I saw The Fog in the theater. These days, you're taking horror and making it more digestible for kids. Uh, the, some of the titles you have. Um, Hyperbreed, first of all, this is this to me is like Fantastic Four meets Star Wars. This is like the Marvel Comics kind of stuff I read when I was pulling books off the spinner rack. Back well, when I, I decided that, that uh, in my experience at the, at the comic conventions, people were coming by with their kids and, the, and they would, first thing they'd say, I'd say these really aren't appropriate um, comics for kids. They're made for adults. They're dealing with existential fear they're dealing with stuff appropriate to our ages and older and uh they go oh he watches walking dead and i go well, first of all i shouldn't but secondly um you know that's like a, a soap with zombies this is scary stuff and i understand kids had very little outlet for age appropriate um horror books and you know we sanitized the Grimm's fairy tales. We sanitized everything on earth around them and we, and we put rubber on the playgrounds. But, you know, there's something to be said for also addressing their fears so that they can process them the way we process ours, like we were talking about earlier. So we started uh, with some young adult books. Niles wrote um, uh, Monica Blew a Werewolf Story. Um, and I got Louise Simonson, who created X Men: The Apocalypse, to write Hyperbreed, and that's and you know, you can't do much better than that for creating a, a, a story for 
for young adults. And then I realized, well, you know, what about the littler ones? They need something because inevitably it's some sticky fingered little kid, you know, reaching up to the table for the gargoyle. And um, so uh, Neo Edmonds, who writes Power Rangers, has just created a great one called the Grimstown Terror Tales. And uh, that one will come out in uh, February. And it has Grub the Booger Troll, need I say more. <laughs> you know, Booger you Troll does it no. all. And then I felt bad for the real little ones who were going to try and get into the other kids' books. So I have uh, Jeff Balky, who has this little, you know, online comic, Stanley the Squirrel. And I said, what if Stanley and his friends have something going on at Halloween and they get scared, but not too scared? And so uh, they wind up thinking that they have, that there's ghosts around where they are in, in their little town. And they think that their fruit's being stolen by somebody and maybe it's the ghost and maybe Bunny Burrow Mansion has something going on. And they prank each other and do all these things. And at the end, after, as they walk away laughing at each other, there's a bunch of ghost bunnies who are watching. Um, and, and that book, it, it, the look is just so classic animation looking. Isn't it? it, it it's like Disney. It is. Yeah. It, the, the, my, that was absolutely my first impression. And I think this is interesting. I, I think you've absolutely tapped into something here. Thinking about Hyperbreed and, and Stanley, their comic books have aged up. I mean, when I was a kid going to the spinner racks at 7 Eleven, I mean, all ages could read them, but that audience has shifted and no one's really looking at that audience anymore. I mean, yeah, in they Japan they are, I guess, but not really yeah, in America. But it's still, manga isn't entirely innocent when you really get into it, like just because it's cartoon drawing, the stories aren't. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, I feel like it's, it's, Ironically, for all the kids stuff that's being churned out in the world, and you feel like, you know, we're going through this other baby boom and there's, you can't walk a supermarket aisle without being hit by a stroller. We're not really dealing with what are the stories that are fun for them, but help them process some fear and yet, yet have fun. It's like, I, I don't want to scare a four-year-old. I want them to have little training wheels on so they can go, it's Halloween, ghosts, jack-o'-lanterns. You know, uh, we've already started next year, Stanley, uh, where Baby Fang, the little wolf who's always being put down for eating everything, uh, thinks he's a werewolf, except he gets the concept wrong and he, he wraps himself up in toilet paper because he, it's like the mummy. And he, he, you know, he gets all misguided about things, but he tries to be a werewolf. I, I love that you're doing this. I love these titles. I mean, I think when my son was five or six, he loved to have me not just read books before bedtime, but comics. And I got to a point, I'm like, there's not a whole lot of stuff I can read him because all the new stuff that was coming out was just, it was too far down that existential path that you referenced. So I think this is, this is really, and, the secret to doing this right, and I think you did it, is making these stories that, as an adult, I can read them. I can pick up one of these hyperbreed books and not feel like I'm being, or that I'm reading a kid's book, that I can still enjoy it. You don't want to vomit. You want a good story. You know, you want to have fun with it. Um, you know, I tested out Stanley on a couple of friends with four-year-olds and stuff. And they don't mind that the kid jumps into bed every morning and wants it acted out again, um, which is, you know, thank God there, there's nothing, you know, that age you want them to want to read, you want them to want the story. And, um, and you want it to be a good story. So that's why I have the same good writers who are writing the adult stuff, right? Tap their inner kid. I mean, come on. Who's better than Louise Simonson? Who's better than Steve Niles? Who's better? You know, these guys are like when you kind of go, come on, you got this. I know you, I know you can talk to a four-year-old. You've got one. Um, <laughs> like I said, th this is, I mean, you're working with A-list talent. I mean, these people, yeah. the, the reputations preceded them before they came to Storm King. Just truly wonderful stuff. 
Uh, not to bury the lead, you have deals going on on your website right now, holiday deals. Um, yeah. A bundle for every budget, every interest? Well, we try. We're supposed to be the, the people's art form. You know, we try and make like we just we just we just did a, a special release of the thing art book signed by John with a a unique box slip cover and and unique cover and um, we could have charged more for it but I I said okay if I were going out to get a Christmas present for somebody I knew was a big John Carpenter fan but I knew that you know I had a budget. Well, let's price it at that. And let's, you know, I try and do that with the comics, um, particularly with the kids' comics. You don't want to bankrupt somebody. It's supposed to be accessible. Um, every once in a while, there's a real high price item. You know, we've got some, you know, uh, uh, rated Joker covers and things like that. Um, but I figure somebody going for that is going for the collector thing. Right. But just from a ground floor perspective, there's a lot of stuff you can easily snap up just yeah. for the interest of, I want to read some cool new stuff heading into the new year. Yeah. So then there's some bundles of, you can get acquainted with Storm King by getting a bundle of, of the uh, tales of science fiction. It'll introduce you to a bunch of the stories. Um, you can do the same thing with the Halloween nights. You can do the same thing. You know, we're now starting um, uh, night terrors. That's just, an assortment of stories that are too long for Halloween nights and um, and they're still cool and scary. <laughs> so. And the, the website, so we don't uh, um, miss that, stormkingcomics.com. Yeah. You mentioned the thing. Is that John Carpenter's best movie? In my opinion, it's a perfect movie. And I can say that because I didn't work on it. Um I think that one holds up on every front of, of character development. Um, the fact that the effects hold up today, the fact that, that um, the story, Bill Lancaster's script is so tight, so cool. The, myst the mystery of the end where everybody thinks they know who's the thing and, and you know, once, once, you know, verification. All of that works. And uh, he was so killed for it at the time. I remember David Anson at Newsweek called him a pornographer of violence. Uh, later rewrote, rewrote that review to be included when the thing was you know, put in one of the Hall of Fames. But um, yeah, he took a lot of hits for it. But to me, it's a perfect movie. It, it still, it does hold up in those effects. In, in, the present where we're overwhelmed by computer effects, the mm -hmm. things that were done in that movie, and just the, that mounting sense of dread that, that builds throughout that entire movie, just it, it really does hold up. I, I would definitely put that on the top of the list. Suspense is what it's all about. And that's what makes a great horror movie. It's not the amount of blood. It's not the amount of, I mean, the thing has great payoffs. It has great, great sh <laughs> this, is, this is this is one of the benefits of the pandemic. Being able to see people's dogs is one of the best things about a glass half full. Here's the best part of COVID. <laughs> On cue, thing dog. Um, this is Mr. Bones. Nice. <laughs> you may go now. Thank you. <laughs> he he was who was cruising your hot dog. Um, <laughs> But uh, I think that that's a great example. The thing is a great example of the amount of suspense that then pays off in gangbusters. But it's the suspense, the parts that really scare you are, you know, the dog coming down the hallway, looking in doorway after doorway, you know, the, the testing the blood where you're just screaming yeah. the time they reach it. Uh, uh, that, that, that is one of those scenes that people continue to point to as one of the most uncomfortable scenes in horror movie history. Yeah, and, and it's all about suspense. Um, yeah, but you go back to, to uh, Halloween and there people don't realize it, but there is no blood in Halloween. And I think people, um, particularly executive types or, or, or inexperienced producers who see horror as a cash cow 
um, don't um, honor the audience. And they think all it takes is, well, we'll do this and then we kill them. And then we, you know, they, they underestimate character development and suspense. Agreed. We're talking about effects then and now. Going back to comics, one of the great things about creating comics is you can have big visions and you're not limited by budgets or special effects concerns. If you can imagine it, you can throw it on a page. You bet. And which is a big difference from movies. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, in Asylum, I can do anything. You know, I can, I can rip the wings off angels and I can send people to hell and, and destroy the entire uh, earth. And it doesn't cost me any more than if I did Archie, you know, um, it's simple. That heaven and hell stuff, that that conflict, that that story concept, it always works. I mean, going back to vampires, I mean, vampires, asylum, it is a great area to mine for ideas because they're big ideas and they're yeah. they're ingrained in so many people. Well, you know, I think when you when you go after inner truths, when you go after uh, who are you, when you go after um, what faith means to you. When you go after, uh, I've had great conversations with um, uh, priests and rabbis about uh, my presumption that they have a certainty about what happens to them after death. And they go, I wish. I go, you don't? I thought that was the whole point. (laughs) And they go, I wish, you know, and so the answer is always, I wish. You know, but I think that people look for certainty people look for answers to things for which there are no answers and they look for it in superstition they look for it in religion they look for and so if you if you write about those things hopefully well you are addressing people's innermost dialogues in an entertaining fashion there's the old adage that says you should go into business with a partner, a, a spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. Uh, it seems like both personally and professionally, you and John have a, a great thing going. I mean, it, it, on paper, this stuff usually doesn't work, but it, it seems like, I mean, you're still together and banging out new ideas and new directions. Do, do you fight at all? Honey, do we fight? Yes, all the time. All the time. Yeah. Do you? <laughs> Not really. I mean, I, I think you're yeah. very lucky. I think you're in a very lucky situation to have that kind of creative and domestic synchronicity. You know, I think I think we're lucky that our ambitions don't collide. I don't want to be him. I don't resent who he is and I had an identity before I met him which comes in handy when you're with somebody that's that's a celebrity at what they do and you could easily lose yourself if you hadn't already established for yourself who you are Um, makes perfect sense and I was very comfortable with my experiences, my work, you know, what I already did. And um, that made that part easy. And I didn't, you know, I, I was happy with whichever doors opened in terms of, and I still am when, when comic books open the door or when producing, you know, I'd produced before John, um, for for other people and I directed second units for other people but um it didn't matter because I, I'm not that personally ambitious a person to want to be the star of the show you so complement each other yeah and um and our marriage works really well uh let's see can you see uh, there's some roses there I see that. Um, they're, they're lovely. Our 30th anniversary was yesterday. Oh, he did it right. Yes, he did. And um, 
you know, I'm, I am grateful for every one of those years and the years before we got married. Um, so it's just really nice to uh, have that both personal and, and professional relationship sure. and feel real comfortable being in production. I am his, his advocate because I believe that we all work for the director's vision. So I think that he has something of a relief with that because uh, it means I'm not really crossing him. <laughs> right. Going back to the business of comics, it, it seems like a challenging industry to dive into. First of all, getting distribution and, and presence on the shelves, which seem to be just more swollen now than they've ever been. Uh, also, you came along at a time of, well, toward the end of transition, really, when comics had moved digitally, when yeah. comicsology became a thing. And people are reading on tablets as opposed to picking up individual issues off the shelves. How do you, how do you slide into that? How do you reconcile or, or vision out an approach as far as print versus digital goes? Obviously they're both important, but how do you create for that? Because back in the day you do single issues. You do, now people write for trades. They write stories for books as opposed to single standalone stories. You know, it's been an interesting time to figure out you, the comic shops have had a rough time, a really rough time. And um, my biggest debate is serving the readers and the shops to try and figure out, you know, you want to give them the product that they can handle and sell. And at the same time, the product, uh, understand that some people want to really get a taste of what's coming. And that's why there's a lot of sales of issue one. Yeah. And then they don't buy anything till the trade. Um, so there's something to be said for keeping up the floppies to a degree, but just know that, that you're essentially going to go, go down on your single issues. Um, and it's been watching that and trying to figure it out. My only consolation is that the same thing's happening to the big boys, the in-betweeners, everybody. Um, you know, I, I talk a lot to Ross Ritchie at Boom. And I mean, boy, is he good at picking writers and stories and stuff. I mean, I think this last year, Boom has turned out phenomenal stuff. But it's been interesting because we've been talking. We're saying, okay, how do we best reach the audience and tell them what we've got and show them what we've got because the conventions um, have been shut down all year, which is the biggest place where you kind of give out samples and or right. people buy a floppy or they do whatever and then they circle back at lunchtime and maybe buy another one or they at least have you on the radar for something later because that's a whole thing with conventions for us is they're, they're essentially a trade show. Oh, absolutely. And um, now how do we reach out? How do we connect with that, with that club that, that, who want to be members, but they just don't know it yet? Um, and you just have to be innovative and find what that, that spot is. And at the same time, cater to the comic shops uh, what we did in certain cases was we went to the comic shops that we knew carried us. And that's a hard thing to find out because Diamond hides the list and, you know, mm -hmm. and they quit delivering comics and quit paying publishers during this. So that was special. <laughs> um, and, but she tried to find that even just any local comic shop, you didn't even know if they carried you or not and go, what do you need? And give them, you know, free stuff and say, you know, who's your biggest, biggest customers? Uh, what do they like? Here. And just gave them inventory. So try this, try, try a sampler of stuff. Um, and here's uh, a bunch of these for free. And uh, if it helps you, great. Um, old, old school hitting the pavement marketing. Yeah, and and trying to be empathetic to the, the, you know the guys that, that got hit and looted in, in riots, and the guys that you know 
it's a community. So you got to figure out how to keep in touch with that community. And then the next thing is the fans. And the fans you're engaging and they're, you know, you know how to find them on social media and, and keep them sated. Uh, you have the app. We, we have the app now where we try and have contests and giveaways of things you can't find anywhere. Like, you know, we had a package that was from They Live. So there were some glasses from the movie. There are, you know, various things you couldn't get anywhere that we could put together something. And the biggest reason to keep that app going is to say, here's where we are. Here's what's going on. Here's what's coming out. And to try and just give information because um, who knows what, what's going to happen on all the big media platforms, whether they're going to all implode at some point. You kind of stop trusting things. So I'm trying to find how do we keep connected? Back to They Live. Were you surprised that Roddy Piper's film career didn't blow up after that? Because the man was pure charisma. He made interesting choices, some of them guided by fear. And a lot of the wrestlers were really um, intimidated because Vince McMahon at WWE wanted them afraid to leave. And um, wanted them to fail at outside careers. And they didn't, most of them didn't have other skills or enough confidence to be something else. So interesting, of course, decades later, film and TV is the obvious next move for so many of these talents in the ring. And, and there were a few that, that, that came from other backgrounds that weren't just part of, you know, Roddy was, was part of, of a family up there in Canada who knew one way that was multi-generational. And, you know, it's hard to step out of that, that world in those footsteps. And um, it was hard for a bunch of them. And it took Hulk Hogan, who had a tough, tough time also moving out of it. But it took the Jesse Venturas, who had a little more, you mm -hmm. know, connection to the outside world. And just then the, some of the later guys came in who had been college football players and things like that, who had a little more exposure to the world outside and weren't multi-generational, I think. I think they started going, you know, really? You're going to tell me what to do with the rest of my life? I don't think so. You know, I'm not going to wind up roided out and with brain damage from hitting the, the mat too many times. Right. Uh, they live to this date still as one of my favorite fight scenes. It's a good one. It really <laughs> is. It doesn't stop. Well, you know, Jeff Amata is a, a supreme uh, stuntman, stunt chore choreographer. I mean, he did all the, the, the Bourne movies. He did the Book of Eli. He did, you know did extraordinary things that he could, you know, like LA Confidential where people are fighting with file cabinet drawers and, and things that you believe every second of. And he knew how to take someone who wasn't actually physically adept like Keith and, and someone who was the ultimate showman uh, fighter, Roddy and, make it so that they didn't, you know, that they did every single move and that rehearsed that thing for three weeks um, and had it down and you bought the best friends. It was a fight, of, the, the thing that made it cool was it was two best friends fighting. Right. Over trying to get you to look through the glasses. I, there are people who over the course of October would post to social media, I'm watching a horror movie every night during the month of October, because it's Halloween month. And I, I think well, that's cute. I'm, I'm watching horror movies like literally every night. And especially during the pandemic, uh, I've gone back to a lot of movies I hadn't watched for a while. I went back to Village of the Damned, which mm -hmm. I hadn't seen in years. Uh, I still enjoy that. They talk about suspense and that mounting sense of dread. And for people who haven't seen it or have just lost touch with that movie, it's amazing to me at the time, 90, 95? 95. Four, I think. Okay. Mid nineties. At that point, you had two of the biggest names in genre entertainment in that film. You had Luke Skywalker and Superman in it. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? 
pretty cool. Uh, I mean, it was a great choice for a, a movie re remake in the first place. But looking back on that, it just, it, like I said, it had been a while. I'm like, oh, God, that's right. They're in it. And there are some really creepy things going on in here. And it was just, it was a fun movie to reconnect with this year. Well, there are really great actors, you know, who happened to do other movies. And I, we were really lucky. You know, Mark had done uh, body bags with us. And um, he just has a lot of depth and always has. And uh, and Chris got a chance to just be a regular leading man. Yeah, it was was cool. Was that his last? Yeah, that was his last movie. Wow. Yeah, that's a tremendous movie. And I referenced vampires earlier. But I love the heaven versus hell stuff. So it, the one thing you haven't done that I know of, that I'm aware of, uh, it seems like the next logical Storm King brand extension, especially during this time when it, when it's harder to reach people than ever. Uh, I think a podcast is in order. Let's, let's, let's get some mics in front of you and john talk about what you're working on have john bust out a, john bust out a synthesizer sorry uh this is don't my, even tell me that's your ringtone that's amazing that is it is my ringtone and that is my assistant calling which means something else has gone to hell in the middle of the night well then i'll leave you with that the strong king <laughs> podcast i i can help you we'll, we'll get some microphones going <laughs> We'll get these cranked out some I've behind the scenes. Told, I told you everything. It's done. <laughs> but, but then you, you could get Louise Simonson or, or Steve Niles on the podcast and ask would, about. Yeah, you know, we've been considering having, uh, you know, artist spotlight uh, kind of things. And, it, you know, it's like, do I have to learn to do another thing? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Keeps it exciting. Uh, Sandy King Carpenter, thank you so much. It, it is a delight talking to you, and I'm proud of you for the hot dog progress we've made. <laughs> thank you very much. You take care.